on our chest and join in singing the Philippine National Anthem. May I request the president of MAP, who is a senior partner and ex-com member of ACRA Law, Attorney Francis Lim, to deliver his welcome remarks. Um, hello. Thank you very much, Maan. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the MAP Board of Governors and the National Issues Committee, or NIC, I welcome all of you to the second webinar on the Anti-Terrorism Bill. Thank you, NIC Chair Risa Mantering, Vice Chair Romy Bernardo, and Governor in Charge Saite Tanko for organizing these two sessions, which are intended to enlighten our members and the other, part, uh, and other members of the business community on this very important law. Thank you, Maan, for moderating the session. We have several laws dealing with anti-terrorism. For example, in 2007, our Congress enacted the Human Security Act. Still later, Congress passed Republic Act 10168, otherwise known as the Terrorism Financing Prevention and Suppression Act of 2012. Yet, years after these laws were passed, the Philippines still ranks ninth among the 163 countries and remains to be the only Southeast Asian country among the top, the top, among the 10 countries most impacted by terrorism. According to the 2019 Global Terrorism Index, the Philippines had 297 terror-related deaths and 424 terror-related incidents in 2018. There's no doubt that we need a strong and robust anti-terrorism law. Interestingly, when both the Human Security Act and the anti-terrorism financing law were passed, the public uproar were not as loud as the public noise surrounding the passage of the bill which we're about to discuss. The question is why? Is it because unlike these two prior laws, the anti-terrorism bill contains provisions that violate our rights under the Constitution? Or is it because we have a strong president who, in defense of accusations of human rights violations under his administration, said in no uncertain terms, your concern is human rights, mine is human lives, end of quote. Or if, is it simply because there is a misappreciation of the proposed law. We're fortunate that no less than the principal author is with us today. Thank you very much, Senator Lapson, for graciously accepting our invitation and sharing your expertise and insights with us this afternoon. As a parenthetical note, I have the honor, I had the honor and privilege to work with Senator Ping when he sponsored a bill exempting from the, the, from the documentized stock tax trading of shares of stock in the stock market, which was one of my pet projects as president of the Philippine Stock Exchange then. I vividly recall personally meeting with Senator Ping and his staff several times to explain the bill. I can personally attest 
that is meticulous and takes pains to understand the implications on the public of a proposed legislation that he was asked to sponsor. I have no doubt that he did the same due diligence on the anti-terrorism bill. Hopefully, Senator Laxon will be able to allay the fears of the public on his bill. Towards this end, he graciously agreed to answer many of our questions today. Foremost among the questions is whether or not the Anti-Terrorism Authority has the power to detain a person without need of a warrant of arrest issued by a court of law, and if so, under what circumstances. Are mass actions like ENSA 1 and 2 punishable under the proposed law in the guise of preventing terroristic acts? Is it correct to say that the bill resurrects the much dreaded arrest, search, and seizure order, or ASO, during the Marcos years? Or are these fears unfounded? To the, two, to the 440 registrants, uh, for Zoom for this Zoom meeting and those are joining us via Facebook Live. Enjoy the webinar. Maraming salamat at mabuhay ang MAP. Thank you very much, President Francis, for setting the tone and for asking the many questions that I'm sure are in the minds of our participants today and which will be clarified um, by our speaker. I just want to emphasize the following important uh, house rules before we start the webinar. As participants in this webinar, we would like to inform you that you are automatically muted and your camera and video are also automatically turned off. Please submit your questions through the Q&A button that you see on your screen on the lower uh, portion of your screen. You will only be able to see the speaker and his presentation and you will not be able to view the other participants. And finally, in case you lose connection, please join again by repeating exactly what you did earlier when you logged in. Now in line with the MAP policy, we will dispense with a lengthy introduction of our speaker who actually truly does not need any introduction in the first place. So may I now call our speaker who was the principal sponsor and one of the authors of the anti-terrorism law, Senator Panfilo Ping M. Lakson. Thank you very much, uh, Maan. The Management Association of the Philippines, President Francis Lim, National Issues Committee Chair Riza Mantaring, respected members of this great association, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. When two great minds or legal minds clash, not symmetrically, not tangentially, but squarely as in head-on. What do laymen like me and probably some of you in this virtual gathering do? I am referring to your last week's guest, retired Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio. On the one hand and on the other, an equally eminent legal eagle, a former Justice Secretary and also my colleague in the Senate, Minority Leader Franklin Rilon. Let me explain. The records of the Senate archives will tell us that the phrase, having been duly authorized in writing by the Anti-Terrorism Council under Section 29, which is now being challenged as unconstitutional by Justice Carpio, as well as IBP President Domingo Egon Cayosa, was actually Senator Franklin Rilon's amendment in the Human Security Act of 2007, later accepted by another giant in the legal profession, the sponsor of the Human Security Act of 2007, former Senator Juan Ponce Enrile, and is merely being retained in the proposed Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. The legislative intent of the bill is clearly to premise Section 29 on a valid warrantless arrest, as also lawfully allowed in other crimes that are not related to terrorism. The provision is compliant with Rule 113, Section 5 of the Revised Penal Code or Revised Rules of Court. Under the proposed anti-terrorism law, a warrantless arrest is allowed under the same circumstances as in any other crime 
by virtue of A, in flagrante delito arrest, and B, a hot pursuit arrest. It was never the intention of Congress to amend the rules on warrantless arrest, or what we also refer to as a citizen's arrest. The same phrase contained in Section 18, entitled period of detention in the event of an actual or imminent terrorist attack of the Human Security Act of 2007, and which has the same language of Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Bill, was voted favorably by a number of distinguished legal experts and luminaries, among others, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Without taking anything away from the Honorable Justice Carpio, who I respect and admire, I would prefer to go along with my former and present colleagues in the Congress of the Republic of the Philippines, not only because of the power of overwhelming numbers, but more so, I am absolutely certain these legislators, as well as their respective legislative staff and legal researchers, had diligently studied, researched, and scrutinized a landmark measure like the Human Security Act of 2007 before casting their affirmative votes as this is the usual and time-honored practice in legislative work. Nothing could be said, nothing less could be said of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 as proposed. I must tell you this, my own legislative staff, all six of them, lawyers in their own right, and in further consultation with counter-terrorism experts, both local and foreign, notably from Australia and the United States, and arguably countries with strong democracies, burned the proverbial midnight oils to help me ably defend this measure on the Senate floor for seven straight session days of intense interpolations and three days of back and forth period of amendments by many of my colleagues, including such distinguished members of the bar as eminently qualified as Justice Carpio and Attorney Cayosa, such as Senators Drillon, himself a bar placer, Coco Pimentel, a bar top notcher, Francis Tolentino, Richard Gordon, to name some of them. Justice Carpio has acknowledged that Section 18, similarly worded as Section 29 of the Anti-Terror Bill, has not been ruled unconstitutional by the High Court. Sadly, he said it in another way, the reason of which he alone would know. For the life of me, I could not understand why the Honorable Justice <coughs> thinks this argument works for his cause when the Supreme Court is clear on the matter of presumption of constitutionality. To underscore, the Supreme Court in Tano versus Socrates, GR number 110249, or yeah, dated August 21, 1997, ruled, and I quote, it is of course settled that laws, including ordinances enacted by local government units, enjoy the presumption of constitutionality. To overthrow this presumption, there must be a clear and unequivocal breach of the Constitution, not merely a doubtful or argumentative contradiction. In short, the conflict with the Constitution must be shown beyond reasonable doubt. Where doubt exists, even if well-founded, there can be no finding of unconstitutionality. To doubt is to sustain." Unquote. It is difficult to understand why a former justice would not know such basic and significant jurisprudence. Anyway, to allay any fears, Section 29 ensures safeguards to avoid abuses by requiring a written notification to be immediately given to the judge of the, of the court nearest to the place of arrest with copy furnished to the Anti-Terrorism Council. We have proposed that the same notification be also provided to the Commission on Human Rights, a requirement not present under the Human Security Act of 2007. On its face, it may appear downright stupid 
and a virtual disaster to be locking horns with the recently retired Justice of the Supreme Court hailed by some of his colleagues in the bench as the best Chief Justice they never had and the incumbent president of the integrated bar of the Philippines attorney Cayosa, especially on legal matters, even touching on some very delicate constitutional issues. Worse, it is not even a three-cornered debate, but two against one who is not even a lawyer. But why am I doing this and gamely at that? My explanation is simple enough. Somehow, I have this habit of standing my ground when I am backed by hard facts to argue my case. I don't stand down when I know I am right. In the same talk during a webinar last June 17, the Honorable Justice Carpio emphasized the inviolable fundamental rights that no less than the Constitution has clearly expressed. First, is that only a judge can issue warrants of arrest, and second, that warrants of arrest must be issued only upon probable cause. I have no argument on this. Neither is there anything in the, in the anti-terrorism bill that says otherwise. But when I will, what I will argue is this averment that the proposed measure blatantly transgresses such fundamental rights. Let me be clear at the outset. The anti-terrorism bill does not encroach, does not allow encroachment by the executive, particularly the anti-terrorism council on the court's exercise of judicial powers, such as the issuance of warrants of arrest, nor does it propose to amend rule 113, section five of the revised rules of court by adding another circumstance in the conduct of a valid and lawful warrantless arrest. This is contrary to Justice Carpio and other critics of repeated claims that Section 29, which I think is the most assailed provision of the proposed measure, allows the Anti-Terrorism Council, a body composed of officials from the Executive <coughs> Department, to give a written authority to police and military personnel to arrest without warrant any person on mere suspicion of being a terrorist. Nothing can be further from the truth. I will belabor these points later on. As we have anticipated, the proposed anti-terrorism bill steers heated debates. Rightly so. We encourage public discourse, especially among the Filipino masses, for a proposed measure as important as the anti-terrorism bill. But unfortunately, the course of the opposing views and opinions unfairly devalues the measure on many fronts, largely because of the various misconceptions, disinformation, and misinformation. Hence, as the principal sponsor and one of the authors of the bill, it is incumbent upon me to take every available platform to shed light on the legislative intent and merit of the anti-terrorism bill and how it is fundamentally founded on the rule of law and protection of basic civil rights. Contrary to the massive disinformation which has already gained traction, especially on social media. Allow me to debunk these false claims against Section 29 of the bill by stating these facts. First, a law enforcer cannot arrest or detain a person on mere suspicion alone. Justice Carpio has stretched his qualms over the bill by citing my statement during a Senate deliberation. He said, and I quote, in the exact words of the principal author of the law, even if hindi naman siya nag-commit ng crime, hindi pa nangyari, pwede na nating arrestuhin. Unintentionally or not, he ignored the context of my response to the interpolation of Senator Gordon. The statement nitpicked by Justice Carpio was in reference to acts preparatory to the commission of terrorism. As we deal with the crime of terrorism, we need to adopt proactive measures that will prevent even the planning phase of the crime. Thus, I explained that under the proposal, we included the proposition to penalize inchoate 
offenses or preparatory acts that are deemed criminal even without the actual harm being done, provided that the harm that would have occurred is one the law tries to prevent, such as terrorism. Preparatory acts, as a rule, are not punishable unless, I repeat, unless these acts are punishable in themselves as independent crimes. It is for this reason that the revised penal code specifically provides that conspiracy and proposal to commit rebellion, treason, insurrection, and coup d'etat are indeed crimes. We added planning, training, preparing, and facilitating the commission of terrorism under Section 6 as inchoate offenses, punishable under the bill pursuant to United Nations Security Council Resolution Number 1373, which states that planning and preparation, among others, are established as serious criminal offenses in domestic laws, and that the punishment should truly reflect the seriousness of such terrorist acts. In these enumerated acts, an inchoate offense is being performed towards the accomplishment of the desired purpose that is terrorism. Hence, these acts are criminal in nature. It does negate Justice Carpio's assertion that under the bill, one can be arrested without doing any criminal act. Let me ask you, when one lays out the plan when and where to detonate a bomb, trains youngsters how to use guns against our uniformed men as well as unarmed civilians and facilitates the conduct of coordinated attacks without being present in the actual act of terrorism and which has not occurred yet and with a clear intent or purpose as enumerated under the definition of terrorism, are they not considered criminals? Do you honestly think people responsible for preparing the grand vicious acts of terrorism do not deserve to be behind bars? Kapag nakita ng mga pulis habang sila ay nagpapatrulya, in plain view, sa isang liblib na lugar sa kagubatan ng Sulu o Basilan, na may mga nagtitipon-tipon at nagsasagawa ng pagsasanay at pagpaplano ng sabay-sabay na pagpapasabog ng iba't ibang pasilidad ng irigasyon at tori ng linya ng kuryente, pati ang ilang simbahang katoliko at mga palengke. Kompleto ang mga sketches sa mapa kung saan ang mga lokasyon ng targets nila kasama ng improvised suicide vests at detonating devices. Ang gusto bang mangyari ng butihing dating maestrado ay maghintay muna ang mga pulis na may mangyaring aktwal na pagsabog at pagkikitil ng buhay ng maraming inosenteng sibilyan bago nila isagawa ang panguhuli sa mga taong halos nasa harapan na nila. Hindi ba krimen ng maituturing ang ganong gawain kahit hindi pa nagaganap ang malawakang pagpapasabog? Yan po ay isa lamang halimbawa ng in-Kuwait offense na hinahangad na maparusahan sa ilalim ng panukalang batas na anti-terrorism law. Kayo na po ang humusga. Moving on, if the ATC or the Anti-Terrorism Council has no authority to order an arrest based on suspicion, it clearly has no authority to detain suspected terrorists and much more fix the period of detention to 14 days extendable to another 10 days. The proposed period of detention of up to 14 days provided in the bill itself and its extension to another 10 days is to be treated as a policy decision of Congress after considering the unique nature and effects of the crime of terrorism. To emphasize, the allowable, allowable periods of detention are determined by Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code, a general law which can be amended by Congress. Looking back at the deliberations of the Constitutional Commission in 1986, records would show that the CONCOM delegates did not have any intention of restricting the powers of Congress to fix the allowable period of detention 
arising from an arrest. Clearly, the three-day limitation to deny a person the privilege to file a petition for the writ of habeas corpus was incorporated in the provisions of Article 7, Section 18 of the Constitution as a safeguard in, the case, in case the president, in the exercise of his powers, suspends the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code mandates the law enforcer to deliver an arrested person to the proper judicial authorities through the inquest prosecutor within the allowable period of detention. Why do some lawyers insist that Section 18, Article 7 of the 1987 Constitution and Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code are the same? Applying the theory of a strict construction, we should follow the word of the law to its strictest sense when technical terms have been used and there should be no room for further interpretation. The express mention of the crimes of rebellion and invasion qualified by the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus clearly excludes all other crimes from Section 18, Article 7 of the Constitution on detention pursuant to the age-old legal maxim, expressio unius, es exclusio alterius. When one or more things of a class are expressly mentioned, others of the same class are excluded. Simply stated, what the law does not include, it excludes. Secondly, the Anti-Terrorism Council's written authority under Section 29 is not an authority to order an arrest. As I have mentioned, the Anti-Terrorism Bill strictly complies with lawful warrantless arrest by virtue of the in flagrante delito and hot pursuit rule under the revised rules of court. In both cases, the arrests are immediate in nature. That said, it is illogical, inconsistent, and even absurd to think that the Anti-Terrorism Council will issue a written authorization to an arresting officer before effecting the warrantless arrest, granting the immediacy and spontaneousness of the circumstances leading to the arrest. Further, when we ask Director General Alex Monteagudo of the National Intelligence Coordinating Agency, or NICA, which is the Secretariat of the Anti-Terrorism Council, he said that never since the passage of the Human Security Act in 2007 has the agency re released a written authority to law enforcers to arrest or detain suspected terrorists. Isn't that enough proof that the written authority mentioned in Section 18 of the Human Security Act of 2007, as similarly written in Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Bill, is never intended to authorize the Anti-Terrorism Council to order an arrest? In actual fact, the written authority issued by the Anti-Terrorism Council under Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Bill is to be directed to its duly designated deputies, such as law enforcement agents and military personnel, especially tasked and trained to handle the custodial investigation involving violations of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 as proposed, considering the complexities and nature of terrorism. Not all police officers are trained interrogators and investigators, especially involving a crime as complex and complicated as an act of terrorism. This especially trained law enforcement officers and military personnel shall need a written authority to, the, to be deputized by the Anti-Terrorism Council to perform such tasks. Attorney Cayosa, in his letter reply to this representation, he stated that Section 29 could not refer to allowable warrantless arrest under Rule 113 because anyone 
can actually effect a warrantless arrest under Rule 113 without any need for, a writ for any written authority from anyone. While it is true that anyone can effect a warrantless arrest, in fact, even a civilian can effect a warrantless arrest, not everybody is trained to properly conduct a custodial investigation, particularly of a crime as complex as terrorism. Attorney Cayosa remains adamant in his own interpretation of Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Bill, notwithstanding receipt of my letter addressing his concerns. The term custody in Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Bill pertains to the lawful custody after a valid warrantless arrest pursuant to Section 5, Rule 113 of the Revised Rules of Court. It is only after a valid warrantless arrest that the law enforcement agent or military personnel authorized in writing by the Anti-Terrorism Council may conduct a custodial investigation. Section 29 does not amend the rules on warrantless arrest. Section 29 seeks to provide an exception to the periods stated in Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code with regard to the crime of terrorism. Third, the Anti-Terrorism Council cannot order a law enforcement agent or military personnel to conduct electronic or technical surveillance of suspected terrorist groups or individuals. Another misinformation is the proposition that the Anti-Terrorism Council shall be the sole arbiter in determining terrorists based on their assessment of suspicious activities like the expression of dissent against the government. Please note that the Anti-Terrorism Council is not a creation of this legislative measure at it, as it has been existing since the passage of the Human Security Act of 2007, and it still functions to this day as a policy-making body. Moreover, by express provision of Section 45, particularly the last paragraph thereof, it is expressly stated that, and I quote, nowhere herein shall be interpreted to empower the Anti-Terrorism Council to exercise any judicial or quasi-judicial power or authority. I think that's clear enough. Thus, under the bill, it is not the ATC, but the Court of Appeals that grants judicial authorization for the conduct of electronic and technical surveillance of suspected terrorist groups or individuals. A look at sections 16 and 17 of the proposed measure would show that the only duty of the Anti-Terrorism Council in this regard is to authorize a law enforcement agent or military personnel to file an ex parte application with the Court of Appeals to conduct electronic and technical surveillance of suspected terrorist groups or individuals. The reason being, again, to prevent possible indiscriminate filing of the ex parte application for such judicial authorization. Lastly, the Anti-Terrorism Council's authority to designate terrorist individuals and organizations does not authorize arrest and detention. On the provision for designation of terrorist individual, group of persons, organizations, or associations under Section 25, Justice Scarpio argues that, and I quote, once so designated, the individual can now be arrested upon order of the Anti-Terrorism Council. This is not only inaccurate, this is plain and simple wrong. Arrests, same as detention, are not the intended consequences of designation. Designation is purely an executive and administrative process intended to trigger the issuance of a freeze order of properties and assets of designated terrorist individuals or terrorist organizations or associations. In fact, not a single mention of the word arrest 
is found under Section 25 of the bill, a thorough reading and analysis of the provisions in the proposed measure will prove former Justice Carpio dead wrong in his assertion. Designation serves as a mechanism to trigger the enforcement of targeted financial sanctions currently lacking in our present law. This mechanism made possible only through an order issued by the Anti-Money Laundering Council, not the Anti-Terrorism Council. I repeat, not the Anti-Terrorism Council could stop the flow and use of funds or assets to terrorist organizations or associations. As, bu as businessmen, you all know how important accessible and easy financial transactions are in our day-to-day -day functions. Terrorism in the Philippines works the same way with financing as the lifeblood of their terrorist operations and networks. More so, freezing of assets under this proposed measure is not a new feature under the bill. As mentioned by President Lim in his opening statement, the proviso or proviso is actually consistent with the existing provision of Section 11, Republic Act 10168, known as the Terrorism Financing Prevention and Suppression Act of 2012. We did it important to include designation of terrorists under the bill to comply with the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1373 and for the purpose of preventing designated terrorists from accessing their funding by freezing their accounts so the same cannot be used to carry out a terrorist attack. Contrary to claims that the bill does not expressly provide a remedy for persons or groups whose accounts were frozen, a designated person is allowed under this measure to question the priest order by filing the necessary petition with the Court of Appeals. We even added a provision under this bill not present under the Human Security Act or Republic Act 10168 to allow partial withdrawal of frozen funds, assets for humanitarian reasons as well as for reasonable family needs and sustenance of the designated person. Ano pa ba ang gusto nila, Mr. President? With respect to Justice Carpio, we must have confused, or he must have confused, designation with proscription of terrorist groups, organizations, or associations. Designation is administrative, not criminal in nature. To effect an arrest, a designated terrorist group or organization must first be proscribed. Proscription under Section 26 requires court intervention where a full-blown hearing will take place before a group or organization may be considered a terrorist organization. It may be done only upon an application filed by the Department of Justice before the Court of Appeals with due notice and opportunity to be heard given to the suspected terrorist groups or organizations or associations. Even membership in a proscribed terrorist organization goes through the same due process of law where the burden is on the Department of Justice to prove. As a legislator who has advocated accountability and transparency through and through, I have personally valued public discourse and critical thinking to all the matters of the state. This is, after all, the cornerstone of democracy. Lest we forget, as we speak, our country ranks ninth among countries in the world that were most negatively impacted by terrorism based on the Global Terrorism Index released in 2019. Needless to say, terrorism generates a circle of fear that broadens and widens through time and across borders. When a church or a building or a public transport system blows up, killing tens and hundreds of unknowing passers-by, everyone shares the sense of, it could have been me. 
It so spear and violence so broad and indiscriminate that everyone, literally you and I, could fall prey to these heinous cry acts of terrorism, which are bound by a single evident truth. Terrorism puts innocent lives in peril. Hence, the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, as a proposed bill, has one clear message. To terrorists who commit crimes against the Filipino people, against humanity, and against the law of nations, our policy will be one that is swift, effective, and constitutional. In conclusion, let me leave you with a simple quote from British philosopher John Stuart Mill. He said, and I quote, a person may cause evil to others, not only by his actions, but by his inaction. And in either case, he is justly accountable to them for the injury. Again, I wish to thank all the officers and members of the Management Association of the Philippines for this opportunity. I am now ready to answer questions from the members. Thank you very, thank you very much, Senator Lacson. Uh, that was a very uh, comprehensive presentation you made, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions from our participants. Uh, I would just like to emphasize that at, the, at this time, uh, because of time constraints, the webinar participants will not be able to be given the op opportunity to ask the questions on camera personally or to, sp to speak in front of, uh, in front of the camera. Um, th please uh, feed your questions to the Q&A, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Now, uh, I would like to start with my own question. Um, going back again to what former Justice uh, Carpio objected to in the anti-terrorism bill, you did uh, clarify that designation by the ATC is only to request the Anti-Money Laundering Council to freeze accounts and the Court of Appeals to, have, to issue, for instance, wiretaps. Um, that, that, that was quite clear. However, um, to lay people like us, uh, the title of Section 29 is detention without judicial warrant of arrest. So this fact plus the fact that there is nothing in the text of Section 29, at least that I've read, uh, that requires the enforcement officer or ATC to secure a warrant of arrest from the court means to a layman uh, that a person can be arrested or detained by the enforcement officer without a warrant of arrest issued by the court. Moreover, Section 29 also uses the phrase Sub suspected person, implying that mere suspicion is enough grounds to arrest a person without a warrant issued by the court. Um, what this means to, again, a non-lawyer is that uh, there is no need for the ar arrested person to be uh, 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 a, a person to be about to commit the, the crime of terrorism or is committing the crime or has just committed the crime as to justify a warrantless arrest. So um, what I'm trying to say is, if it's confusing to people like, like us, and a person like me, not a non-lawyer, but I studied English, that was my ma major, um, <laughs> would it have been best to amend the provision to conform to the legislative intent? We know what you've stated your legislative intent, but it just doesn't seem clear in this section. Thank you, Ma'an. Uh, section 29 is so entitled detention without judicial warrant of arrest. The reason being, we are amending the regulatory period from the third or three day uh, maximum detention period under the Human Security Act to 40 days. So we need to uh, place the uh, title detention without judicial warrant of arrest. Mm -hmm. Another reason is, uh, uh, for or to clarify the yeah rule 113 section 5 or, or warrantless arrest ano hindi naman natin ito binago mm -hmm. it is applicable to all crimes as a matter of fact even slight physical injury or simple theft 
Rule 113, Section 5 is still applies. So we are not changing that. We are not amending. We, what we are amending is Article 125 of the uh, uh, Revised Penal Code, which is from 36 hours and then three days uh, under the Human Security Act to 14 days, extendable to another 10 days, by not by the Anti-Terrorism Council, but a court of law that will grant the police officers an extendable another uh, period of 10 days on top of the 14 days. Now, the 14 day period is a policy decision of Congress. And uh, it is not within the powers or authority of the Anti-Terrorism Council to order the detention of an arrested suspect based on valid uh, and lawful warrantless arrest. You know. Uh, to be detained uh, for 14 days. It is the law itself that authorizes the detention uh, of up to 14 days. Thank you, sir. Um, here's a voting question. Does the Anti-Terrorism Council have a set of rules and regulations with which to perform its functions in terms, for instance, of quorum, uh, among others? Should such rules and regulations not be publicized before the law takes effect? I think there's a it lot of fear about this uh, ATC and uh, the, 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 the more clear we are and the more transparent we are, we are about how they operate, I think the better for the public. The IRR should be published you know, for the public to, to know. Uh, nothing can be hidden if, I, if an IRR or even the law itself, once approved by the president, it is published uh, in the official gazette and the uh, newspapers of general circulation, and so forth and so on. Now the IRR will simply, will uh, likewise be published. It has to be published. Uh, who is going to draft the IRR, sir? Is it uh, the, the ATC? ATC well? Yeah, the ATC and then uh, 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 the, the agencies involved. Even the Senate uh, and, and Congress can participate in the drafting of the IRR. But basically, it's the Anti-Terrorism Council that will okay. spearhead the uh, uh, crafting of the IRR. Here's another question that you already dealt with, but you know it doesn't hurt to repeat it. Can anyone that the government tags as a terrorist be detained without any warrant or, or definitive period or definitive proof? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, we, all, we always follow Rule 113, Section 5. You know, yung, uh, the circumstances leading to a warrantless arrest. We are not veering away from Rule 113, Section 5 of the revised rules of court. Nothing in this measure uh, says that uh, we are adding another exception or another circumstance. Okay. That is the uh, main misconception because of massive misinformation and misinterpretation of the provision. Um, uh, sir, another, another question from Anonymous. The timing of the passage of this bill seems to send the wrong message. Put very frankly, why was this bill certified as urgent while we're in the, we are in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic and the economy is in shambles? Uh, first, uh, terrorism, ito muna ang premise. Ano? Uh, terrorism knows no timing nor borders. Hindi naman pwedeng sabihin sa terrorist, oy, may, may COVID-19, wag muna kayo magbomba. So, and on the part of the Senate, we passed this measure on third reading. We approved this on third reading last February. Mm -hmm. So, and we started hearing uh, uh, or conducting committee hearings way, way back in 2018. And it took us uh, seven straight session days. It took me you know, to respond to interpolations uh, of my colleagues, you know, notably the lawyers. Most of them interpolated me, including uh, uh, Senator Kiko Pangilinan. You know, and uh, they in, both uh, he and uh, Senator Riza Ontiveros introduced amendments. In fact, the, uh, the amendment, the inclusion of the, hum of, of the Commission on Human Rights, Amendment po yun ni Ontiveros, which I accepted. Unfortunately, when uh, the voting on second reading and third reading uh, came, they, uh, they uh, cast uh, dissenting votes. Only two of them. 19 senators voted in favor. 
and uh, two, uh, dissented. Um, there's a question from Vic Mag Magdaraog. Uh, section 4, subsection, definition of terrorism states, engages in acts intended to cause death or serious bodily injury to any person. What are these acts? Have they been defined? Well, it is clearly defined in the definition. Remember, these are individual acts, but this is further qualified by the intent and purpose and the nature and context of the uh, acts of terrorism. You know, magko qualify. It is not plain act of causing uh, death or bodily harm, bodily injury. Hindi lang po yun ang element. Kailangan uh, may establish yung purpose, yung intent and purpose. Ito, eh, uh, nakalagay sa board, you know, engages in such acts, in any acts intended to cause death. But, merong qualifier ito, plus purpose, yung intent and purpose must be clearly established. Kung ang purpose lang is to cause death or serious bodily uh, harm uh, to any person, uh, hindi mag, uh, magiging sufficient yun uh, para mag-fall under uh, the anti-terrorism bill of uh, anti-terrorism bill. Kailangan merong uh, kasama na, na purpose, intent and purpose. Sir, uh, we'll go back to the uh, Commission on Human Rights. Uh, Mr. Arps de Vera has a question. Will the Commission on Human Rights, a constitutionally empowered body, have complete and full access to the records of designated and arrested persons during the process of implementation of the anti-terrorist bill or law? After all, the CHR is the guardian of our Bill of Rights, which will be suspended in the course of the bill or the law. And um, in line with this, I was just watching another webinar, and uh, CHR Commissioner Gwen Pimentel Gana uh, said, and I quote, the process must be replete with provisions for respecting human rights and not just pay lip service uh, declarations. Uh, um, and, and, and I think it's because Section 55 and 59 of the HSA, uh, the CHR seems to have been marginalized and its concurrent jurisdiction to prosecute violators of civil and political rights of persons suspected and detained for crimes defined uh, in Section 55 of the Human Security Act is removed in the new uh, uh, Senate Bill 1083. Also, courts handling terrorist cases are no longer required to report the status of cases to Congress as provided in Section 59 of the HSA. Is this accurate? That is the, yeah. Is yeah, that is the very reason why in, we included under the proposed measure uh, the CHR in the reportorial requirement. So they will have full access, they, they will have full visitation uh, privileges or rights. Uh, those sa uh, suspect those sa uh, suspect na naresto based on warrantless arrest uh, lawful warrantless arrest yes. now yung uh, concurrent uh, jurisdiction to prosecute yun po ay violation ng constitution because kung babasahin yung mandate ng CHR no hindi ka sa hindi sila pwedeng mag-prosecute only the DOJ the ombudsman ang merong karapat o merong uh, mandate to prosecute Law enforcement agencies and uh, agencies like the Commission on Human Rights uh, cannot be given the power or the authority to prosecute. That is beyond their mandate and it will clearly violate the Constitution. See, since that was in the Human Security Act, uh, then the HSA was violative of the Constitution. Does well, nobody can say that because uh, only the Supreme Court questioned. can declare that uh, an act is unconstitutional. Probably it was not raised before the Supreme Court. So uh -huh. I will go back to my previous uh, thesis or uh, premise that uh, ang presumption lagi, constitutional yung isang batas, unless beyond reasonable doubt, the Supreme Court says otherwise. Um, uh, sir, uh, there was... Probably if somebody brought that, that up uh, with the Supreme Court, yung particular uh, provision na yun, baka na-declare ang constitutional. Uh -huh. Okay. But nobody did. Yeah. Um, there was an ouster plot matrix indicating persons or groups allegedly conspiring to discredit President Duterte released by Malacanang in 2019 or 2018. 
Could this report, which is allegedly based on intelligence information, become the basis of warrantless arrest under the bill? No, ma'am. Uh, kailangan mag-adhere uh, mag or mag-comply sa provisions under the definition of, the, uh, of acts of terrorism. And uh, again, I will emphasize that uh, uh, only uh, the circumstances that would, should lead to a lawful and valid warrantless arrest uh, should be followed. Um, Kaya nga pa ulit-ulit kami rito, acts and purpose. No? Kung alimbawa, murahin nila na murahin si Presidente araw-araw, hindi sila makakasuhan ng violation ng Anti-Terrorism Act. Makakasuhan sila ibang kaso. <laughs> but okay. not violation of this proposed measure. Okay, thank you, sir. A question from Cedric Castillo. Given a hypothetical situation, a law enforcement agent wit witnesses what he appreciates as planning of terrorism activity and makes the arrest on the spot. When does the 14-day detention period kick in? The moment uh, the person is arrested, don't magka count yung, uh, yung countdown ng 14-day period will start at the moment the person was arrested. Now, that is precisely the reason why we need the ATC to issue written authority to especially train you know, individuals to conduct the custodial investigation because any policeman uh, on his own discretion may interpret you know, a, a person to be committing acts of terrorism. Now, uh, when he is subjected or that person is subjected to custodial investigation, that is the time that the uh, persons trained or the officials trained to conduct custodial investigation will, you know, step in and say, hey, Mr. Police Officer, hindi ito papasok sa, anti, uh, sa violation ng Anti-Terrorism Act. So you can file probably a simple murder case, homicide or illegal possession of firearms, illegal possession of explosives, but not uh, uh, an act, but not, uh, will not fall under the under the Human Security or the uh, Anti-Terrorism Act uh, of 2020 as proposed. Okay, uh, the uh, corollary to his statement, uh, his question, he says, critics are saying bill becomes dangerous when discretion is given to law enforcers. Well, may mga safeguards dito. Once the law enforcer violates any of the provision, may mga safeguards na nandito. First, immediately after the arrest, he should uh, notify in writing the judge uh, of, uh, of the nearest court you know, where the arrest uh, was effected or conducted. And then specifying uh, in, his, in their report, yung place, name, time, all the uh, five W's. Kaila report nila sa judge. Safeguards are in place you know, under uh, pain of uh, being imprisoned for 10 years and uh, perpetual, absolute perpetual disqualification from public office. Ngayon, kung yung arresting officer nagtago hindi ma-identify, the immediate superior will be answerable. That's also a feature of the bill. Para hindi pwede yung, yung uh, commanding officer or yung superior officer, eh, hindi namin na-identify sino nang huli niyan eh. Ang mananagot, siya, siya yung makukulong ng sampung taon. Um, This is really an replete. Yeah. yeah. I'm Ang sorry. dami safeguards dito, maan, napakarami. Dinagdagan namin ng dinagdagan. Um, from an, an anonymous attendee, based on the webinar where attorney Kayosa spoke, his issue is that the wording of the law is not clear. This was supported by Commissioner Gana, who's saying that the law itself should be read alone without the help of other laws and still be understood. Uh, hence, why did the author prefer to adopt the wording of the Human Security Act of 2007 when he could have corrected the confusion in the first place? Well, this is not mine and mine alone. You know? 24 senators work on this bill. And we adopted uh, certain provisions under the Human Security Act while there is a repealing clause you know, that uh, once this uh, bill is approved or enacted into law, uh, effectively repealed na yung Human Security Act. But we retained some provisions. And as I mentioned, ang nag-introduce ng amendment na ngayong kinu-question, eh, hindi naman matatawaran siguro yung galing ni Senator Drilon. And accepted by another, sabi ko, legal, another giant in the legal profession, Senator Juan Ponce Enrile, 
voted by now DFA Secretary Teddy Boy Luxin, Ed Silagman, Chimion Datumanong. Pinag-aralan nila ito because yun, yun naman, the problem is you know, those who are criticizing, probably this was the first time that they read the contents of the measure. But kami, kami mga legislators, together with our staff, our researchers, talagang ito yung naging bread and butter namin, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, no, for the longest time. And we diligently conducted research, everything in scrutinized ito. And then people now who are criticizing, I would suggest that they should read and read and read and read muna yung contents of the measure before criticizing because it's all there. As I mentioned in my presentation, all the concerns that they are raising now or they have raised, sinagot ko naman eh, naandun eh. Uh, sir, uh, perhaps you can enlighten us as to why um, the Senate and, uh, and Congress decided to enact a new law rather than just uh, uh, amend the Human Security Act. Couldn't... Uh, because that... Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. As mentioned by uh, President Francis kanina, ano eh, ayaw niya lang sabihin pero dead letter law. Because in spite of the passage of the Human Security Act of 2007, only one conviction ang nangyari. Ito yung si Noor Sapian, uh, federalismo, democratic, or yung allied with the Mauti group. Ano? Mm -hmm. uh, isa lang ang conviction after how many years. Ano? And isa lang yung proscribed organization, which is the Abu Sayyaf. So we deemed it twice. Again, it was Senator Drillon who suggested that uh, we might as well repeal the Human Security Act instead of just amending it. No, I think my recollection is uh, correct. Ano? Mm -hmm. um, sir, from Ben Punong Bayan, um, Senator Laxon, the sense that I got from your speech is that the enforcement of the anti-terrorism law will require a very discriminating, well-informed, and fair-minded group of enforcers. I fear then that there would be many occurrences of misjudgments and abuse of discretion that in the whole, the law may just invoke fear on the part of our citizens. It may also be used as an effective tool of imposing political power. May I hear your response on this comment, please? Thank you. Well, if the police officers are ready and prepared to go to jail for 10 years, you know, to stay in jail for 10 years and lose all their benefits, retirement benefits, their pensions, and uh, uh, prevented from holding uh, public office for life. You know? this, is, this is absolute disqualification or perpetual disqualification from public office. Well, if they're ready to lose everything, including their freedom, then they, they uh, commit abuse or abuses. It's up to them. But you know, if the premise is uh, a, a measure is subject to abuse or open to abuse, then we might as, as well not uh, pass any law anymore because all laws, we cannot guarantee that there won't be any abuses. That's why we put in uh, so many safeguards. Para yung law, by the way, I also presented this before the PNP. And I made sure that they are made aware and they are now very conscious of the repercussions of uh, some very simple violations. Just a mere uh, non-compliance doon sa reportorial requirement. Sampun taon sa bilibid. Ganun ka simple. Here's, here's uh, my own question, sir. Uh, just yesterday, yep. the Viber group of my St. Scholastica classmates, high school and college, was all abuzz with a posting that was made by um, Presidential Communications Operations Office Undersecretary Lorraine Badoy. And uh, she posted a very, very long post on, on her Facebook. I, I printed it. It's back and forth. And basically, she tagged Sister Mary John Manansan, Order of St. Benedict, who was my teacher, was our dean, uh, tagged her as, uh, uh, with links to uh, terrorist organizations. And um, it seems uh, she cited there, um, uh, Yusek Badoy cited there, uh, uh, Gabriela, for instance, as a front. Um, what I'm afraid of is that this is starting a spate of red baiting and um, witch hunting um, 
I mean, the law hasn't even been passed yet. It hasn't been signed yeah. by the president yeah. yet. And already an undersecretary of the communications office of the president is posting things like this against uh, one of our nuns in Stains Go. Well, and, first and, and, and what she cited there is that uh, she is close to these people. She is an honorary chair of Gabriela, and uh, the Gabriela has uh, has uh, given her certain honors, and therefore she must be a supporter of a front of terrorist groups. First man, personally, I don't believe that because I had marched with Sister uh, Manansan in the streets before. Yeah. We were together, we were marching before, and this law, this measure, and myself, we're not bound by the opinion of Yusek Badoy. A any person can express his or her opinion, but the question is it binding on the measure or is it binding on myself as the principal sponsor? No, the answer is no. And I said, I will repeat, I don't believe that Sister Mary Manson is a terrorist. Thank you, thank you for that. I'm sure my classmates will be better tonight. Uh, they have a prayer brigade going on. Uh, but, sir, maybe you can tell us what, what groups have already been uh, designated and, and or proscribed as uh, terrorist groups in the Philippines? There's only one, uh, Abu Sayyaf group. Yeah. So, in other words, the CPP, NPA, uh, uh, and, and all the leftist organizations have not been designated nor proscribed. There is an ongoing trial. The case, I think, is uh, pending at the Manila RTC. But because of the passage of this, uh, this measure, once approved, we elevated the level of uh, the authority to, pro to prescribe from RTC to Court of Appeals. That's another safeguard. Because uh -huh. uh, some of my colleagues, they believe that uh, not all RTC judges can be you know, responsible enough to be discerning and objective in proscribing uh, organizations and, and groups. A question from an anonymous attendee. Um, do you have a series of solid data on the instances of terrorism in the past five years? Uh, we have, we, we have past five years. Uh, yes. In fact, we gathered this uh, data from the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology. No? Out of the 735 detainees, and tawag yung HDL, uh, high risk persons de de deprived of liberty. 735. Most of them, yung nando sa Maute, do sa Barawi. Yeah. Not, not a single uh, person undergoing trial is undergoing trial for violation of the Human Security Act. No? Yung Abu Sayyaf naman, 86 yung uh, nag undergo ng trial. 66 have been convicted so far. 20 were acquitted. Out of the 66 convicted, wala ni isa man na convict ng violation ng Human Security Act. That's uh, how toothless, that's how the Human Security Act, uh, in effect, is a dead letter law. There's a question from Id Narbana Su. Uh, Sir, the law against cybercrime paved the way for the creation of the PNP anti-cybercrime group. The law against illegal drugs long created also the PIDEA as principal office dedicated to attend to it. Even so, even the domestic crimes against women and children also resulted in the creation of Women and Children Protection Desk of the PNP. Is it also appropriate that perhaps a specific, competent, and dedicated law enforcement institution or at least a composite police military force be formed in order to be responsible for addressing the necessary intelligence, law enforcement, and legal mechanism in the fight against terrorism and its instrumentalities. In other words, those people that will be receiving written, in, written uh, uh, authority from the ATC, can they be put into a special composite group? That is correct. It, uh, it, I would like to assume that uh, it will be a composite team uh, of NBI, PNP, AFP. No? plus plus and they will be properly trained to handle the custodial investigation and even you know uh, since they are law enforcement uh, officers uh, they may be uh, when confronted with a, a crime or an act of terrorism being committed in their presence whether it's a arrest but sila lang yung special group specially trained and tasked 
to conduct the custodial investigation. Yung po yung lagi namin sinasabi, sila lang yung merong, sila yung nangangailangan ng written authority from the ATC. Not every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the police force uh, will be given a written authority because as I mentioned, it will be illogical and even absurd to, for the police officer confronted already with a crime being committed in his presence to even await the issuance of a written authority from the ATC. So yun din sinasabi, nakakasundo kami ni uh, IBP President Cayosa uh, mm -hmm. doon sa bagay na yun. Hindi talaga kailangan because it's already there. Rule 113, Section 5, and nandun yung mga circumstances. Employee granted delito, hot pursuit, and determine of course yung escape uh, prisoner na hindi na kailangan ng uh, warrant to arrest. Um, from Patrick Reidenbach to all, uh, is there a repercussion for falsely branding someone as terrorist? Well, he can, uh, uh, the aggrieved person can always uh, seek redress, you know, file a complaint if uh, it will fall under any of the violations under the revised penal code or uh, other special laws. Um, okay. Um, question from Jay Conching. Uh, what if the alleged incohate offense is only a made-up made story? How can you be sure that it is really factual or true in nature, sir? Who validates the validity of warrantless arrest? Can the ATC be an independent body to free itself from the influence or directive of the executive branch of the government to avoid possible abuse? The evidence itself will validate if it is really an incohate offense. No? And the courts will determine the validity of arrest, even at the level of the prosecutor. A person has been arrested, you know, and the prosecutor, upon inquest, uh, sees that there is no basis for the arrest in the first place. So he can be uh, released right away, ordered released by the prosecutor. The, because remember, the person will be brought before an inquest prosecutor. And mm -hmm. this has happened many times before. Uh, a person suspected of committing a crime is brought before an inquest prosecutor. It's either the inquest prosecutor will release the arrested person for further investigation or outrightly release him without charges. But at the end okay. of the day, it is the court that will determine the validity of arrest. Um, and a, a person deprived you know, of liberty uh, na unjustly, he can always uh, file charges against the police officer concerned. Um, a question from Christopher. I would like to ask what the rationale for extending the number of days without warrants of arrest from 3 to 14. 14 days, and uh, in line with this, that's still extendable by another 10 days. So um, as from, aside from this question, I'd like to ask, can that 24 days be recycled to another 24 days? No, that's the maximum. And by the way, the 14-day period need not be maximized if the police officer or the investigating uh, officer uh, finds sufficient ground, you know, to or a, uh, is able to build up a very solid uh, case against the arrested suspect, then maybe three days, four days, five days, or even one day should be enough. Lalo na kung in flagrante delito and uh, yung terrorist has acted uh, or acted alone. You know? Like in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, di ba, merong nanaksak dun. Tatlong, in the, the findings of the British police, he was acting alone. So there's no need for a prolonged period of uh, detention and right away the police can just file uh, the case or inquest uh, subject the person uh, to inquest proceedings within one day because the evidence is clear the the 14 day period came about uh, because the law enforcement officers that we invited you know as resource persons they shared their own uh, experiences Mm -hmm. Even my own colleague, Senator Ronald De La Rosa, when he was still chief of police of Davao City, you know, he arrested a uh, suspected terrorist. But since the regulatory period was so limited or so limited to three days, he was forced to release the person knowing that they failed to build up a, a strong case. And then after, I think, uh, more than one year, he saw a video footage uh, yung tao na hinuli niya at nirelease, namumugot ng ulo. 
that's his own personal experience that he shared with us uh, in his co-sponsorship speech because he uh, he uh, requested that he be a co-sponsor of this measure, being one of the authors also. From Ramon Samson, in reading the plain language of the bill, is it correct to say that if a person is detained after his warrantless arrest without judicial charge, he, can po he cannot post bail? Hence, would this not be violative of his constitutional right to bail? Thank you, Mr. Senator. There's no bail yet because the court fixes the bail. If it's under custodial investigation, nobody can uh, post bail because only the court the prosecutor will, will recommend, and this is a uh, available uh, non-bailable offense, by the way. So, so it's no case filed there. There is no right to bail because there is no case filed yet. And even if a case was filed, since it is a non-bailable offense, he would not be subject to bail. Well, he can petition, file a motion for bail, but uh -huh. the motion for bail should be addressed to the court. Um. I, I, I know that you, you firmly believe that the, the, the bill uh, does not violate constitutional provisions, but... I'm, I'm firm on that. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're quite firm on that. But um, uh, let's just say, let's just say, suspending your own belief, uh, what should be done or could be done to address the bill's perceived violations of some constitutional provisions? Like, for instance, when I said, perhaps it should be clarified a little bit more um, uh, so, that, so that there's no room for misinterpretation? Uh, yung ikaklarify sa IRR, mas mapapain-tune yung certain provisions. Like uh, implementing rules yun eh. Pagdating ng pag-craft uh, na ng IRR. But you know, uh, who are saying that the, some provisions are vague? Those who are criticizing but we are not accepting that. In fact, that's the reason why, you know, I'm very thankful that you gave me this opportunity to address your, uh, your association. And I, I just hope that after this uh, session, uh, many among your members uh, shall have been enlightened. I'm hoping anyway. Um, uh, will the Philippines be sanctioned or downgraded to the gray list by the international watchdog Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, if the anti-terrorism bill does not become a law? Well, right now, we are classified as partially compliant, gray. And one reason is that we have a weak terrorism financing uh, uh, prevention and suppression act of 2012. No, when I met with them, uh, representatives from the FATF, ang uh, sinasuggest nila, reasonable ground to believe, pwede nang i-freeze. Sabi ko, nako, naloko na tayo. Hindi po pwede sa Pilipinas yan because uh, marami ritong uh, kritiko pagdating sa human rights. So, probable cause, but not uh, reasonable ground to believe. And I think, once the bill, this measure is passed into law, we have uh, a uh, good chance of being uh, uh, being excluded from the uh, gray list because that's what they told us. So has, how does the anti-terrorism bill uh, uh, fare in comparison with uh, the other countries' bills? Uh, uh, is ours more lax than, than others? We are very kind. Ours is one of the kindest. Okay. Um, Yung section 25, uh, Maan, if you read or the audience, the, the members uh, would care to read section 25. Ang in-address doon, yung uh, concern ng FATF na nag-provide ng mechanism to implement the financial sanction, sanctions. Kasi under the under 10168, hindi malinaw yung pagpipis ng, uh, ng uh, assets, ng accounts. So we provided a mechanism na pag-designated, then the uh, Anti-Terrorism Council will request the Anti-Money Laundering Council to freeze the account. And that's, also, that's already within the mandate of the Anti-Money Laundering Council. Mm -hmm. But I repeat, uh, nothing can prevent the designated uh, 
individual or groups na i-petition or questionin niya before the Court of Appeals yung freezing ng kanyang accounts. Um, Risa Mantaring is asking, um, Senator Laxon's explanation of arrest before the crime has been committed is that if they're planning a terror act, you should be able to arrest them even if they haven't actually committed it yet, the bombing. Aren't there already existing laws which cover such circumstances of planning terrorism? We have arrested terrorists in the past even prior to actually committing the, the crime. If it has been determined that they are planning to do it, I guess this is where the old provision of requiring surveillance before warrantless arrest comes in. No, ma'am. There's no law, um, anti-terrorism law, that penalizes. This is a new feature in this bill because uh, we are, our attention was called by uh, the United Nations Security Council. Kasi meron sila yung United Nations Security Council Resolution 1373. Eh, it's, they're calling uh, on different states no, to strengthen yung uh, kanilang uh, uh, fight against terrorism. Sir, going back again to that um, phrase that, that really bothers a lot of people, uh, having been duly authorized by the ATC in writing, uh, you've already explained that the authorization of the ATC is primarily to ensure that these people are well trained, uh, they know the law, they know how to, how, how to implement it, uh, and it isn't that the ATC is authorizing them to do the arrest. But no. the wording, again... Wrong, wrong. Not Man, sorry, I have to cut you. The ATC is not authorizing anybody to order or to conduct an arrest. The conduct of a warrantless arrest is under Rule 113, Section 5. It's in the revised rules of court. Yes. And the ATC is not uh, you know, supplanting any, uh, any authority over Rule 113, Section 5. Yes, they sir. cannot you order the arrest. You explained that, sir. But um, uh, it's not clear in the wording of, of that phrase that, that the authority, right, written authority is simply to uh, designate people who are able to, to carry this out. Um, so will the IRR be able to address this? Yes, the IRR will address that. That they, tawagin uh, na natin for purposes of discussion, counter-terrorism group. That will be the group composed of trained individuals to handle the custodial investigation of arrested terrorist suspects by virtue of Rule 113, Section 5. Another question. If the anti-terrorism bill becomes a law, uh, will rallying against the anti-terrorism law constitute terrorism? No, definitely not. <laughs> Ito yung mga disinformation. <laughs> Kaya kami nahirapan magpaliwanag because uh, sabi nila, yung, kasi yung Bill of Rights, Nandito eh, yung Article 3, Section, I think Section 4. You know, yung guaranteed yung freedom of assembly. Yung, remember sa uh, Section, uh, meron siya sa Section 4. No? If you go down further, ang liwanag ng qualification dun eh. Na sinasabi sa Section 4, uh, yung advocacy, dissent, protest, industrial, and mass actions, hindi kasama rito. Ayan no? Terrorism as defined in this section shall not include advocacy, protest, dissent. Isn't that guarantee enough na yung section, yung terrorism o yung warrantless arrest, uh, hindi kasama yung mga legitimate, ayan o, no, mapakaliwanag. And further uh, clarified pa sa section 45 na yung Anti-Terrorism Council never bibigyan dito ng uh, authority uh, to uh, to exercise judicial and quasi-judicial powers. Okay. Um, it, it, it was mentioned that the Anti-Terrorism Council can tag organizations as terrorist groups. Does, the, does this apply to employees as well? Meaning, mere employment in a company tagged as terrorist organization may be considered engaging in terrorist activities and may cause the employee or uh, employer's arrest? No. Membership will have to undergo 
uh, another set of due process of law. No? Mm -hmm. It is not automatic. Say, uh, just for example, on a CPP and PA, uh, eventually it has been proscribed as a terrorist group or organization. It is not automatic that any body who is tagged as a member will be arrested. No. It is upon the DOJ no, to prove before the Court of Appeals that such and such person is a bona fide member of the terrorist organization so proscribed. Hindi rin automatic. Kailangan may due process pa rin. Yung proscription undergoes due process. Merong notice of hearing, merong, uh, merong uh, bibigyan ng pagkakataon to be heard and defend themselves ano, as a group. But once that association or organization is proscribed as a terrorist organization, it is another matter altogether na yung members mag undergo ran then ng the same due process of law. Ang nakalagay dito, any person who shall voluntarily and knowingly join, eh, kailangan knowingly, voluntarily nag-join ng organization na alam na niyang terrorist group yon proscribed na. But halimbawa, you are a member of an organization that has not yet been proscribed or designated proscribed, yeah. as a terrorist group. And then down the road, it becomes designated or, and proscribed as a terrorist group. Your membership there will make you also culpable. No. No. It's not automatic. Kasi hindi pa naman siya proscribed kung nag-member ka But, you know, once it is proscribed and you knowingly and voluntarily uh, join that organization that has already been proscribed, then, but you will have to defend yourself. You know? Hindi naman din automatic. The DOJ will have to convince the Court of Appeals that such person knowingly and voluntarily join uh, that terrorist organization so proscribed by the Court of Appeals. So in other words, once it's proscribed, then you, you have to uh, abandon your membership. Yes, but if you, you know, proscribe now and you still voluntarily uh, remain a, a member of that group, that's a different matter. No, but supposing that uh, it's being challenged, uh, the, the group no, that's being challenged, there's no final decision yet. If the uh, terrorist uh, organization is already uh, proscribed as a terrorist organization. So, dalawa yun eh, dalawang steps. Ano? The mm -hmm. terrorist group will have to be declared as a proscribed a terrorist group. Okay. And then the members individually kailangan pa rin i-prove ng DOJ convince the Court of Appeals that such member voluntarily rem remains or voluntarily joins uh, the organization already prescribed. Okay. Um, since the bill affects the freedom of the press or freedom of speech, how do you think this will affect election campaign speeches? Wrong premise. Hindi nakakartel dito yung freedom of the press at saka freedom of speech. Wrong premise yung question na uh, uh, mali na yung premise kaagad. Um, while the IRR have not been published yet, will the law be already in effect once it is no. signed to law or lapses into law? Uh, the law is in effect but without IRR it cannot be implemented. And, uh, because the law, any measure, any law takes effect upon publication. Pero okay. yung implementation, that's another matter. But if it's already in, in effect, does that nullify the old Human Security Act of 2007? Yes, but some provisions have been retained. No? Yung IRL will be drafted not only by the ATC. Remember, DOJ is part of the ATC. Yes. No? yes. And DOJ will be very much actively participating in the crafting of the IRR of, the, uh, of this measure. No, but, but what, what, what we're asking, sir, is that if you have to wait for the IRR to implement the bill, um, and the bill uh, already um, uh, cancels the previous bill, um, then isn't, that, isn't there like a, a, a vacuum there? where there is a bill but it cannot be implemented? I, I don't think so. Because implementation and uh, effectivity are two different matters. No, Section 56. You know? Yeah, yung repealing clause. You know? 
Yeah. Ito, yung saving clause, ano? Section 57. There's a saving clause. All judicial decisions and orders issued as well as pending actions relative to the implementation of Republic Act number 9372, meaning the Human Security Act, otherwise known as the Human Security Act, prior to its repeal, shall remain valid and effective. So there's no vacuum. Uh, there's no vacuum. All right. Um, is the anti-terrorism bill consistent with the definitions and conditions set, set about by the United Nations? Definitely. Yun ang, yun ang standard natin, yung United Nations Security Council uh, resolution. Even if a uh, foreign jurisdiction or a supranational jurisdiction like the EU, for example, no, nag-designate sila ng isang grupo, say the CPPNPA has been already designated by the U.S. government as a terrorist group way, way back in 2002. But does, that does not bind us because our parameters, our standards uh, are set by the United Nations. No? Merong mga definition na andyan din sa billion eh, yung standards set by the United Nations Security yeah. Council. Okay. Um, again, from uh, anonymous attendee, who's the most popular questionnaire, um, According to the Philippine National Police, theft, physical assault, and robbery were among the most common crimes reported to authorities in 2018. Other common crimes included pickpocketing, confidence schemes, and credit card fraud. Terrorism is not among these prevalent crimes. With very limited public funds, shouldn't you focus funds on addressing these common crimes instead of sponsoring a bill that is subject to so much controversy and divisiveness? Again, the assumption is wrong because precisely the police officers, you know, refuse to file cases uh, for violation of the Human Security Act because uh, it is, a, well, it becomes a dead letter law because of the 500,000 pesos per day of detention na uh, multa. Mm -hmm. Kaya hindi silang papile. You know, yung Maute, they did not file, uh, uh, that's a terrorist act, definitely. So many uh, civilians uh, died in, during the carnage. And yet, uh, he, yung, the, the police officers and the military personnel, they, you know, somehow they uh, avoid uh, filing cases under the Human Security Act. So, mali yung assumption na walang terrorism nangyayari. So, sa uh, lang, around a thousand people died. And uh, their, their series of attacks, series of acts of terrorism, only the PNP, uh, they have avoided to file cases against, uh, against those persons under the Human Security Act. Um, sir, is it true, as reportedly stated by Senate President Tito Soto, that if the bill becomes a law, there is no more need to declare martial law? What does this was really mean to ordinary citizens like you and me? It well, was quoted out of context. No, man. Yeah. Ang nangyari, when we were discussing the extension of martial law, I asked the security sector, the security officers, in a caucus, what end state are you looking at to, uh, to stop or to, uh, not to extend martial law in Mindanao anymore? And the answer given was, if the anti-terrorism bill is passed into law, then we will recommend to the president not to extend anymore. Maybe that's the context na na quote si Onomis quote si Senate President Soto. Okay. Uh, human rights groups are worried that the anti-terrorism law could lead to more cases of extrajudicial killings targeting dissenters in general, but especially activists, labor leaders, anti-mining advocates, etc. This will discourage the people to challenge policies that the state have condoned, for example, mining permits, POGO, changes in the constitution that would allow foreign ownership of land and public utilities limited by the present constitution or, and give more powers to the president and or the military and adjust the term limits of elected officials. And this will also discourage people to challenge negative practices in public offices of public officials. For example, 
graft and corruption, extra bureaucratic practices, biased policies against marginalized sectors of farmers, workers, and the urban poor. Man, uh, where can you find a law that requires reporting to the CHR? So the CHR can inspect, visit, uh, investigate, ito lang. Ordinary crimes like murder, the police is not required to report to the CHR in writing. Ito lang yung namumugutang batas na ipapasa natin na yung arresting officer should immediately notify, among others, the Commission on Human Rights. What are the safeguards, again, in the bill to, minim to minimize, if not avoid, abuses that will curtail our rights under the Constitution? It's the bill itself because yung fundamental rights, the Bill of Rights, uh, hindi naman, we did not go beyond the provisions of the Bill of Rights. We are well within the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. Okay. Will the Congress have an oversight role in the formulation of the implementing rules and regulations to make sure that they are consistent with the proposed law, especially provisions that protect human rights? I mean, would you, for instance, have a hand in it since since you know what the legis legislative intent is, are you going to be Section, yeah. consulted? Section 50, uh, Ms. Maan, Joint Oversight Committee. Yeah, a Joint Congressional Oversight Committee is hereby constituted. The committee shall be composed of 12 members with the chairpersons, etc., etc. Okay, so the, uh, although is oversight is an inherent function of the Senate, but you know, under Section 50 we expressly state here that there is a joint oversight committee of Congress. Sir, if it is found that any language or phrase in the bill does not conform to the legislative intent, as you have uh, explained to us, to protect constitutional rights, are you open to sponsoring further amendments to the bill after it becomes a law to prevent or at least minimize abuses on the part of the executive department? Definitely. Uh, we can introduce amendments or further amend the uh, Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 once it is uh, enacted into law. Nothing can prevent uh, a senator or a congressman to file a bill to amend, you know, even immediately upon its uh, effectivity. If somebody wants to file, then yes, we're open to uh, further improving without admitting that there are constitutional infirmities, of course. Yes. But if the purpose is to uh, further enhance the measure by way of its, uh, you know, its implementation and uh, uh, safeguards, then we're willing. We're open to that. Okay. Uh, does the act apply to foreigners staying in the Philippines? Yes, foreign terrorists. It is so defined. Does the bill cover violations outside the Philippines, like, for example, by a Filipino uh, demonstrating and spreading fear publicly in another country? Yeah, clear violations of ter uh, the, the act of terrorism, yes, it can be covered. But we, can, we should acquire jurisdiction first because if it is, if it is outside uh, of the jurisdiction of the Philippines, how can we reach him? But once that foreign terrorist or that Filipino lands in our shores and we are capable of prosecuting him, then uh, he can be prosecuted. Uh, sir, there, there, uh, we, we are running out of time, but we will extend because there are so many questions still pouring in. Uh, this one is from Grace Ralios. Will this bill or law, when enacted, put a stop to extrajudicial killing and other forms of terrorism against civilians by those in power? Will this strengthen the firearms law restricting unlawful ownership of guns and firearms used for acts of terrorism? Man, I'm not in a position to guarantee that. No. If I guarantee that, it will be on me if somebody commits. <laughs> I cannot because that's implementation. And there are laws that uh, should uh, be applied to policemen, like the killers of Keandel Santos. It is through the Senate investigation, I think, which I headed, you know, because I was then the chair of the Public uh, Order Committee, and we uh, conducted inquiry in aid of legislation uh, about the killing of Kendall Santos in Caloacan. And it helped, you know, that 
the uh, executive department, the DOJ, filed a uh, murder uh, case against the three policemen. I think they're now in jail. Uh, or they have already been convicted, I think, mm -hmm. by the lower court. Uh, sir, a question from Vic Lim. Senator Lacson, should not the definition of terrorist or suspect in, in, uh, under the law not be tightened to eliminate the fear of misinterpretation or abuse by the ATC? For, for instance, some lawyers have opined that frequent critics of uh, President, Duterte, uh, President Duterte's policies and actions, um, such as on the frequent EEL case, I think he meant EJ case, like Bishop Ambo David could be subject to warrantless arrest sim simply because the ATC decides he is a suspected terrorist. No, he can be insulted back by the president. <laughs> I myself was at the receiving end uh, uh, one or two times. And you know, when I criticize the president, you know, that's, that's his uh, nature. You insult him, he'll insult you back. But you will not be in prison. Uh, uh, in, in fact, yung bishop na sinasabi, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not in jail, di ba? And no case or cases uh, have been filed against him. Question from Rex Drillon. The NPA has been conducting acts of rebellion and other crimes that have affected the lives of individuals and companies. Will the anti-terrorist bill of 2020, when approved, finally pave the way for also calling them a terrorist group? It depends on the act performed or acts performed and the purpose, the intended purpose. We'll always be bound by that. Um, question from Ramon Samson. So the detainee would languish in jail for 14 or even 24 days without any charges. Will you allow yourself to be detained without being charged judicially? <laughs> That's the law itself. You know? But it, it should not be exhausted. exhausted eh? Sabi ko, if in a day's time, the police can find sufficient, uh, can build up the case to build up a strong case, then in a matter of one day, they can uh, bring him before the inquest prosecutor. From Susan Warren Mercado, Senator, in discussing the incohate section, you emphasize that only uh, with the commission of a crime prior to the actual commission of the suspected act of terrorism may a suspect be arrested. In this case example, you cited the group of people in the hinterland seen in plain view to be training for various bombing scenarios in true to life locales. What is the crime committed prior to the actual bombing? I ask because lawyers of the extremists presumably also know how to argue such arrests. They could say the suspects were merely doing a civilian boot camp exercise. Yeah, because uh, that's, the, uh, that's the meaning of the of in Kuwait offense. It is a crime in itself. You know? uh, we need not wait for the actual bombing because that would entail loss of innocent lives. That's why we included uh, under, this pro under the provision uh, of, the, uh, of this bill uh, in Kuwait offenses, any stage of uh, the uh, uh, planning, preparing, training, ayan, kasama yun sa ano. Um, question from Gillian Asdala. As the, Gillian Asdala. Does the 10-year imprisonment against false baseless arrests also include pecuniary penalties? Yes, included. Uh, they won't be prevented from seeking damages. No? Yung uh, civil code will, be, will still be in effect. No? So in kasi other words... Superplus, superplus nga yung 500,000 pesos a day eh, kasi naandyan na rin yung sa civil code. Eh. Ah, pagka, okay. no, you, can, you can file for damages. Eh. So they don't get a free pass on the, on the money side then? <laughs> Can we expect with the ATB a more difficult condition for terrorism and bombing to happen in our country? In other words, a safer Philippines? This is from Ambassador Carol. That is the intent, legislative intent, to come up with a strong, effective, but, un but constitutional uh, anti-terrorism uh, measure. Okay, um, Vic Lim's question, which was partially answered already by you, why was the monetary penalty against erring law enforcement officers who are proven guilty of wrongful arrest removed on your bill? Was this not an effective deterrent against abuses by overzealous law enforcement officers? 
you said it, it rendered it a dead letter law. Yes, that's one of the reasons why the Human Security Act is rendered a uh, dead letter law. Um, uh, another question, uh, does, does, or, does or can this bill cover, cover harmful acts against nature, specifically the environment that we have sovereign right over? Yeah, biological. The living entity, yes. Biological substance included in the bill. The, the use of, uh, you know, yung, uh, mass destruction. But no, it, no, I, sa definition, uh, environment. Yes, yes. In other words, acts I against don't think there is a provision. Mulan. I don't think there is a provision uh, uh, under the measure that would include destruction of the environment. Um, Critical infrastructure, uh, lives, but not uh, environment. Um, Parang hindi na to nakaka-relate sa acts of terrorism. Eh. You mean destruction of corals? Yeah, uh, yes, for instance. A <laughs> let's say a terrorist group decides to attack and uh, blows up our reefs. It depends actually on the circumstances. If it will fall under the uh, definition and bound by the uh, intent and purpose. Uh, for which the acts were perpetrated, then, yeah. We'll always be guided by the definition. Uh, um, can can uh, participating in events such as EDSA 1 and EDSA 2 be constituted uh, as, as an act of terrorism? No. No. Okay. Um, uh, any more questions uh, from Pia Sophie Ditke? If I participate in a rally and with, with the other demonstrations, demonstrators block a main road to cause interference with this infrastructure and that action has the purpose of provoking the government, will I have committed terrorism and be sentenced to life imprisonment? No. Even if it... Yeah, because he's there on a uh, participating in a peaceful assembly. Now, oh. if there are groups that will perpetrate and commit acts of terrorism, then that group or those individuals will be liable under the measure. We're always bound by the acts and the uh, purpose and intent of the individual or individuals. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, one, uh, one last thing. I think maybe if you can just again emphasize uh, designation by the ATC that uh, you said it is an executive and ad administrative process and does not yeah. authorize law enforcers to arrest, conduct surveillance, or restrict travel. Can you just expound yeah. that again? Because there are still many questions regarding that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, designation is entirely different from pres prescription. Designation is purely administrative. It is not criminal in nature. Yung prescription man requires court intervention. It is not uh, discretionary on the part of the ATC to proscribe uh, a terrorist or, uh, an organization or association as a terrorist organization. It is only the court that can uh, render that decision. Now, there's a clear delineation uh, between designation and prescription. Kaya nagtataka nga ako bakit si Justice Scarpio hindi niya na, na distinguish ang sinabi niya sa inyo once so designated the person uh, can already be arrested in the first place and designation uh, administrative ito eh hindi ito mag-encroach yung ATC sa authority ng uh, ng court yung judicial and, and uh, quasi judicial powers Sir, back again to the prescription, there's another question. It says, uh, because an organization can only act through its members, can an otherwise legitimate group, like the MAP for instance, find itself proscribed because, some of, its, because of some of its members' personal acts? 
No, I don't think so. Because once the, the uh, group or association uh, is prescribed, it will go through uh, a series of hearings. Eh? They will be heard, you know. And if it can be proven that it is not sanctioned by the, but by the MAP and only some members uh, have uh, perpetrated acts of terrorism, then there's no reason for the MAP to be proscribed as a terrorist association. Um, you said that... Ang yung yung members will be charged for the violation of the Anti-Terrorism Act. But not the organization. Not the organization because these are individual acts or uh, hindi sanction unless MAP uh, recruits uh, new members to uh, to uh, commit acts of terrorism. That's a different matter. <laughs> and then, of course, due process is guaranteed to the Management Association of the Philippines. It's <laughs> a, a long process. Yeah, a committee on terrorism, in other words. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, can you uh, clarify again? Prescription entails a judicial process asking the court to declare uh, a, a group as, uh, or person as terrorist. But ex parte preliminary order, is it already a equivalent to a declaration of terrorism? And uh, are the uh, limits to a person's uh, uh, liberty uh, also as severely curtailed as, as no. when it's actually prescribed? No, that is not so. Yung preliminary order prescription, kasi yung Abu Sayyaf, it took, I think, the court to proscribe uh, Abu Sayyaf group uh, after eight years. So, nilagyan lang namin na limit na, but every three years, merong review. You know? Yung na-proscribe, uh, magkakaroon ng uh, review. You know? Yung preliminary order of prescription will be decided by uh, by the Court of Appeals, no? not the ATC. But the prescription, it is uh, subject to court intervention. Um, Ayan, section 27. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, if the CPP NPA uh, is on the list uh, of, of um, groups that are being considered for prescription, um, the CPP and DF claim to be revolutionary organizations. Does the anti-terrorist law differentiate between a revolutionary group from a terrorist group? How would you personally classify them and why? Again, we'll go back to the definition, the acts uh, plus purpose. Acts plus purpose. And don't lagi yung, ano, yung parameters. Acts plus purpose. It's not just the act, but it should be, you know, uh, intent and purpose should be the qualifying uh, element. So, um, how would how would you differ, how you, would you uh, differentiate right now uh, the CPP and NDF? Uh, do you, would you consider them revolutionary, or they could possibly be terrorists? Only the court can de can decide. Uh, okay. Because so right now there's a pending uh, case uh, against the CPP and PA to be proscribed. Only the court can decide that. All right. Um, if the bill is signed, uh, would, you, would you advise the people active in these organizations to go underground to avoid arrest? <laughs> if, may qualification, di ba? Knowingly and voluntarily joining a proscribed organization or association. So why there's no reason for them to go underground uh, if uh, they they will renounce once the CPNPA, CPP and PA uh, is proscribed as a terrorist uh, organization. So they can actually they can actually leave the movement uh, at that point, and they will yes. not be, they will not be uh, considered terrorists uh, for for their past membership. They should remain as uh, members knowingly and voluntarily. If not then in this uh, wedding Aristohen being uh, a member or members of that proscribed organization. Um, sir, I, I would like to thank you for 
this uh, very, very informative session. And we'd like to give you uh, the last words. So is there anything you'd like to summarize uh, that might not have been covered in the Q&A? Or that well, you'd like I to just, cite again? I just hope that uh, in, in my own little way, I'm able to enlighten the members of the Management Association of the Philippines. Because uh, sinabi ko kanina, nag-gain ng traction, especially on social media, because there's a lot of misconception, bordering on misinformation, disinformation, and uh, yeah, I am very thankful the, to the Management Association of the Philippines for giving me this opportunity, this platform, to explain or enlighten the members uh, on the provisions uh, of the anti-terrorism bill. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Laxon, and at this point, I would like to uh, get back to uh, our president, Attorney Francis Lim, to give us his closing remarks. Attorney Francis Lim is uh, muted. I'm mute. Hello? Hello? Uh, you're on. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Ping Lakson, uh, for taking your time and patiently answering all the questions that were raised. No? I'm sure that uh, your answers have enlightened no? uh, many of our members and guests on the issues that they had in their mind. No? So on behalf of the Management Association of the Philippines, I thank you once again for this very rare opportunity. Um, as, I, as I anticipated, uh, Senator Laxon did his due diligence and uh, he was able to demonstrate that though, by the presentation that he made and by the answers to the many questions. No? Uh, he knows the law to the minutest detail. Uh, that's, that was very obvious. And uh, I hope, um, um, Mr. Senator, that if there are any clarifications that we will need about the law, I'm sure there will be uh, we, uh, you'll make yourself available to us because this is a very important legislation for the country. Um, many issues have been clarified. For example, that uh, Senator Laxon said that it's not only the act that should be considered, but it's also the purpose behind the act. No? So the act alone per se, the act per, the act per se should not be considered in determining whether, uh, whether or not one is uh, guilty of terrorism under the law. It has also been clarified that advocacy, protest, dissent, or exercise of civil and political rights, like uh, marching the way we did in ENSA 1 and ENSA 2, are not per se violation of the law. And uh, I think um, one thing that I've learned is that on almost all fronts or aspects of the law, except those instances where warrantless arrests under the uh, rules of court no, is justified court intervention is necessary and due process is observed, or at least intended to be observed. I'm sure that there, still be, uh, there will still be clarifications that are needed. And I'm glad that Senator Laxon has said, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, Mr. Senator, that the IRR will try to address this concern. And uh, more importantly, the Senate um, uh, Congress will have an oversight role in the formulation of the IRR, and I think that will go a long way in trying in clarifying many of the doubts that we have. Most importantly, I think uh, Senator Laxon has said that uh, in case there's a need to clarify certain language, certain phrase, or even a provision, Congress is open to a further refinement or amendment of the law. Thank you again, uh, Senator Ping. Thank you, Ma'an, for ably moderating this uh, um, Session. Thank you, Arnold and the staff for patiently organizing this. Thanks again to the National Issues Committee. And last but not all, thanks to all participants. I've been observing that uh, um, on Zoom alone, um, the participants have stayed on. No? That's how, that just goes to show how important it is to, the, uh, to them, uh, this bill, and how um, they really appreciate Senators, uh, Senator Laxon's uh, being with us uh, this afternoon. Again, uh, maraming salamat and uh, keep well, stay stay well and uh, 
hope to see you uh, once again in the near future. Hello. With this, uh, the meeting, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.